1940. The shadow of tragedy and defeat hung over our country. France had collapsed, and the BEF, fighting the greatest rearguard action ever known, reached the fire-swept beaches of Dunkirk. Only the fighting spirit of the troops themselves and the achievements of our seamen and the Royal Air Force saved them. Their equipment was lost, but the men brought back were all ready to repel the invader. Britain was indeed on the defensive. It was then that Mr. Eden announced the formation of the Home Guard, or the Local Defence Force, as it was first called. The response was immediate and overwhelming. From all over the country, volunteers rolled in, and soon they were in training. At first, they were short of equipment, uniforms and weapons. Short of everything, in fact, except that indomitable spirit which carried us through. Inspired by the leadership of Mr. Churchill, our war factories worked day and night in a desperate effort to re-equip our forces before the impending invasion was lodged. As a prelude to a full-scale attack, the Luftwaffe was sent in terrific strength to blast our aerodromes and defence works and so ensure a successful channel crossing. We all know the story of those days, how those few men in those few aeroplanes flung themselves against the mass of attackers matching German numbers with unbelievable courage and beating them from the sky. Never was the spirit of Britain better displayed to the world, but it was a defensive courage courage in the very face of disaster. In those days, it was always the same story, defense. When the Germans began their wholesale attacks on our cities and towns, British civilians were in the front line for the first time. Powerless to hit back, their bravery in the face of danger, their we-can-take-it attitude was another serious blow to Nazi plans. as our factories turned out more aeroplanes, tanks and munitions of all kinds, we can take it, change to we can give it back. To our increasing output were added the vast industrial resources of the United States. Everybody was looking forward to the day when our aircraft would smash deep into Germany's war industries, when our tanks would crash through the Nazi panzer divisions, when Britain would turn from defense to attack. The implements of war were piling up. New factories were getting into full production, many of them underground, safe from German bombs. More and more girls took their place in industry, releasing men for sterner jobs. Surely we should soon be on the offensive again. The Home Guard was now more fully equipped and trained so that greater numbers of our regular troops could be sent abroad to other theatres of war. Russia, at first sorely pressed and fighting for her life, had changed to the offensive. British built tanks promised by the government on behalf of British workers were helping to repel the Germans before Moscow before Leningrad and in the Ukraine. Russia's fight against tremendous odds thrilled the world. In the tank factories, superhuman efforts were being made to fulfill our obligations. Russia must go short of nothing she needed, and at the same time our own growing mechanized strength had to be not only maintained, but increased. By night, our bombers were striking hard, deep into the heart of Axis war industry. To the Wellingtons, the Whitleys and the Hamptons had been added bigger, faster types. Manchester, Stirling, Halifax and Lancaster. 
names which strike a chill of fear into the German heart. Fighters, instead of facing overwhelming odds over Britain, were carrying the war to the enemy. Every day, hundreds of them were swarming over the channel on offensive sweeps or escorting bombers on raids over occupied territory. In doing so, they kept a large part of the fighter strength of the German Luftwaffe on the Western Front and helped the Red Air Force in the struggle to gain command of the air in the east. For the first time since the war started, the enemy were being harassed and kept guessing, and what was far more important, they were being forced on the defensive. Commandos were raiding the occupied coastline from Norway to France. The Nazis never knew where the next blow would fall, and large numbers of their first line troops had to be held in readiness for coastal defense. Paratroops, trained for attack, were soon in action. At last, the initiative was passing to Britain. American troops arrived from across the Atlantic. Their purpose, not so much to strengthen our defense, but rather to be on hand, ready to play their part in the last great offensive, the Allied Offensive. It was a new spirit. Army training now was primarily in methods of attack. secret of this great change. Simply the unconquerable spirit, the will to win of the people as well as of their leader. Everybody played a part in the defense period. It is even more important that everybody should play a part now. We have shown our ability to take it. Now let's show that Britain can give it back, not tenfold, not a hundredfold, but a thousand times. Lend to defend was the slogan two years ago. Now it is back the attack. Already the tremendous onslaught has started. It's up to you to play your part. You must lend to back the attack.
aircraft factories need more coal to turn out more bombers. More ships bringing more supplies need more coal. With all these demands on coal, it's up to the householder to economise. How they do go on. Well, it's true, you know. Yes, I know it is. But what are we going to put in that grate next winter? Tea leaves? Now, don't get excited, madam. Blimey, who's that? Only me. What I was going to say was that the government are asking you to do two things. Order your coal as soon as possible and take 10% of it in coke or anthracite. But does coke make a really good fire? Oh, yes, if you go the right way about it. You light the fire in the ordinary way with coal using small lumps. Thank you. And when it's going well, add some coke or anthracite to the top and back. Thank you. Oh, and be sure to keep the underside of the fire clear of ash to get a good draught. There you are. So remember, order it now and be sure to get 10% coke or anthracite. Good burning. Nice day. Oi, what about our radio? We want to hear it, Ma. Sorry, sorry, I forgot. wastes of the Arctic, the polar bear seeks his prey. But the little Eskimo is far too smart to be caught out. In the sweltering depths of the jungle, the lion is ready to pounce on the unwary. The child of the jungle knows all about lions and looks twice before venturing in the path of trouble. In the heart of the city, we're all far too civilized for polar bears or lions, but... <coughs> Stop before you cross the road, look right, look left, then go. Stop, don't rush across the road, that's dangerous, you know. Trying to beat the traffic is a foolish thing to do. On your way to school or play, you must remember every day. Stop before you cross the road, look right, look left, then go. This is the tale of Billy Bart, who learned his road rules off by heart. And every day would holler, man, I'm not a soppy date like Sam, cause I know all the rules I do, uh, which is mum cried thanking you. So listen to me carefully, and you'll be just as safe as he. At the curb we all must halt, for not to do so is a fault. Look right, then left, then give a glance. Once more to right, don't take a chance. Quick march, if there's nail to belt, don't run, or you'll fall and clear out your snout. On pedestrian crossings, there'll be slaughter if you falter when you didn't alter. Don't play football, he or rounders, in the streets like some daft bounders. So we must be all like Billy Bart and learn our road rules off by heart. Now, when you cross the road, remember your curve drill. Look right, look left, and then look right again. Next, if there's a stationary car, look carefully around it before you cross. Now, say it over to me. Look right, look left. Yes. Then look right again. Then right again, of course. Yes, good. Next. Look. Very carefully, if you cross behind a stationary car. Good! Now, you won't forget, will you? I won't. That's me today. That's me again. This time a year ago. You notice I'm a little put out. Well, I had nowhere to go for my holiday. Everywhere was full up. 
Then I saw this and decided to have a go at it. I don't mind telling you, I did find things a bit difficult for the first day or two. I wasn't used to this kind of life. But I quickly settled down and soon began to feel really fit. Everybody was very friendly and I was interested in the work. Besides, I got a kick out of helping to solve the world food shortage. Yes, life was very good. So, I'm going again this year. And I'm taking the wife with me. And that's why I'm looking like this. Everybody likes potatoes. They're grand, wholesome vegetables and a valuable part of the family menu for buying. Aye, housewives will be sorely tried if the spuds suddenly vanished. That's why volunteers for the potato harvest do a really important job. This year, Scotland will produce one and a half million tons of potatoes. And just because sufficient spare labour doesn't exist, the children are again asked to help. 54,000 of them. It may mean a week or two off school, of course, but the need is a serious one. And fresh air is a grand tonic. Oh aye, and they're paid at the rate of one and a penny per hour, mind. And don't think that they're allowed to run wild. Maybe they do have grand fun, but they're carefully looked after by teachers and others. So don't hesitate to let your son or daughter volunteer to help with the potato harvest. Get them to ask their teachers for full particulars. All our schools are agreed that the pupils benefited greatly in health. Yes, working on a farm last year did my boy a world of good. Fairly built him up for the winter. The boys and girls who help with the potato harvest think it's great fun. But it means a lot more than that. I would never have got in half the tatties last year had it not been for the bairns' help. For three weeks, these children live in the country with plenty of fresh air and good food. To them it's just grand fun, but they're actually doing a most important job and getting paid for it. Let your child come along. Believe me, it's in all our interests. You can make arrangements through the school. Not everybody breakfast off hot dogs. And some get indigestion at the very first suggestion of a tasty little dish of snails and frogs. Some people can't face porridge at morning. Hot curry isn't baby's favourite dish. But when it's time for tea, why young and old agree, if you can't have chips, it's no use having fish. A stew's not quite the same without the Murphys. A rissole on its own goes like a flash. And think of Sunday's lunch without roasted spuds to crunch, or sausages without a bit of mash. The spuds are there, but someone's got to lift them, and autumn is the time to lend a hand. So sign on right away for holidays with pay, and come and lift potatoes on the land. Don't forget now, come and lift potatoes on the land. You know what's happened, don't you? Another power cut. They go on about exports and filling up the shops with the things that people want to buy, and we have hold-ups in the middle of a job because there ain't no power. And you know whose fault it is, don't you? Yours. Won't you please try and cut down on electricity at home and help us out? You've been asked before, you know. Thank you. <laughs> 